Osteotomies, what are we talking about? We got to this classification system a bit during the uh, osteotomy example. Type one, so that Frank Schwab classified these, and it's actually a very nice classification system that should stick around because it's fairly consistent. It makes it easy to communicate about what we are doing. Uh, type one is an inferior facetectomy. A type two is a Smith-Peterson or Ponte or what we call posterior column osteotomies in St. Louis. And, Lenke's pushing that uh, because people have called Ponty Smith Peets, Smith Peets Ponty's, and they're not exactly the same if you read the history of those osteotomies. So just call it posterior column osteotomy, which is resection of the facet joints in the back and the intervening ligamentum flavum and uh, some lamina so that you can bill for it appropriately too. <laughs> type threes and fours are uh, variations of pedicle subtraction. So type three is what we just did in the lab where you leave the cranial disc. Type four is where you take the cranial disc, that's the so-called extended PSO. Uh, and as I talked about in the, in the lab, you have to be very attentive to uh, avoid too much anterior column shortening when you do one like that and parking a cage up front uh, or leaving a sort of a hinge of bone and levering around the front of the vertebral body uh, like Dr. Larmartina. It's probably the best way to get ex, uh, extra angular excursion through an extended PSO. Fives and sixes are vertebral column resections, right? That's everything in the back and disc to disc for a five and six is a multi-level vertebral column resection. So type one osteotomies, what are the indications? It's just a facetectomy. I, I do it in every case, literally every case. I can't fathom doing a spinal fusion and not doing an inferior facetectomy and getting rid of the cartilage. If you don't get the cartilage out, it's not gonna fuse. Cartilage does not turn into bone. It's not gonna turn into bone. You need to take that joint off so that you can decorticate the superior facet, get rid of the cartilage, decorticate it, and hopefully get a fusion at the facet joint. Um, but we do it for multiple reasons. One, you do the inferior facetectomy, you give it to the back table, it's a source of bone graft. Allows you to decorticate the joint, like I just said. Also helps loosen the segment up a bit. I think this is mostly seen actually in uh, lumbar degenerative scoliosis or lumbar degenerative cases where they get the big overgrown walnut joints and they have a desiccated disc in the front. It's not moving a whole lot and all of a sudden you take that facet out and free the two segments up and all of a sudden you can move the bone uh, a bit. And then visualiz visualization of the superior facet in the thoracic spine is uh, mandatory for placing uh, safe freehand thoracic pedicle screws. You wanna see that superior facet and you don't ever wanna start in the medial half of the superior facet. If you start sites in the medial half of the superior facet, you're gonna make a medial breach. You need to be starting in the lateral half of the superior facet. So it's four, four reasons to expose the superior facet with an inferior facetectomy. Type two osteotomies, so these are commonly Smith-Petersons or Pontys and uh, lots of conversation. Smith-Petersons actually through a fused segment, for example, uh, ankylosing spondylitis, that was originally described. And the Ponty is resection of the facet joints and the flavum with distal and proximal lamina at the flavum insertions. Uh, I don't do many type two osteotomies in many cases at all. I do about 40% of pediatrics. I have done three PCOs in the last four years. I did them recently because my partner does tons of them and he swears that they're the greatest thing since sliced bread for adolescent idiopathic scoliosis surgery. I did three and I was like cussing myself out for the rest of the case because it export, exposed spinal cord with a resonant in the case and a little bit more bleeding. And ultimately with 6-0 rods and very stiff rods that we have now or if you use uh, one of the sort of non-round rods. Those things are really stiff. You put good screws in, you can pull that spine to the same place that it was going to go, uh, even if you take out all the joints. Uh, so I, I don't like to do it. The harms data for it is not convincing. Uh, there's lots of talk about sort of, quote, restoration of normal kyphosis and restoration of anatomy. Um, Peter Newton looked through the harms data, and if you had a front back, an anterior release, formal anterior release, discectomy, ALL release, followed by posterior column osteotomies at every level, those patients got 10 more degrees of kyphosis than someone that had no posterior column osteotomies. If you had only posterior column osteotomies, those patients on average got five more degrees of thoracic kyphosis than no osteotomies. And in general, this is a hypolordotic condition, and nobody is going from a 20 degree lordotic thoracic spine to 40 degrees of kyphosis for something normal. So I, I think that even if you five, there's no clinical relevance to five degrees difference in, in my hands. And now my AIS cases are fast. 
really low blood loss, the harm study group sends out um, dashboards so that you know how you're doing relative to your peers. I have the second highest mean curve size. There's some people that their mean curve size is about 50 degrees, which is remarkable. I don't understand how that's possible. Uh, but I have the second lowest blood loss and I have the second lowest pedicle screw density. When we all kind of get the same correction, which just tells me that the, what it tells me is that in idiopathic scoliosis, that spine's gonna go where it's gonna let you take it. And that's about it. If you wanna restore normal anatomy, like if you really wanna make it straight and derotate it and have good sagittal plane parameters, you'd need to do an apical VCR, I'm convinced. And that's totally insane. Um, that's not going to happen. So I let the spine tell me where it's going to go, and I don't do uh, posterior columns. I also don't do them in Shermans anymore. That's how they're sort of really popularized for dorsal column shortening. Uh, in kids, right, these are not ankylotic joints. These are kids. Cartilage on cartilage for the neurosurgeons in the room. Uh, hyaline cartilage on hyaline cartilage is more slippery than ice on ice. So it's not a source of friction. Shortening is not a problem through ice on ice, right? That's not gonna be a problem. And if you look at your post-op x-rays, a lot of the times the correction in a Sherman's case is anterior column lengthening. And again, Sherman's, the, the limiting factor is really gonna be length of the spinal cord. Uh, you straighten them too much, you're either gonna lose data or you're gonna straighten them too much and they're gonna get a proximal junctional kyphosis because in our experience, you don't really wanna shorten them or, or change their uh, kyphosis more than 50% or so, unless you do a VCR which is sort of starting to push it for a condition like uh, Shoreman's disease. I do really think that, that type two osteotomies are helpful in adult degenerative scoliosis. It, it, when they have those desiccated vacuum discs in the front, but a relatively fixed deformity, when you take out the joint, you take out the flavum, which you're probably gonna do anyway. Uh, it really loosens things up to help you put it where you wanna put it. Uh, and then also those people tend to be a bit flat and you're gonna try to restore some lordosis. And you've all seen the degenerative scoliosis that you're operating on for disease, uh, you know, deformity progression um, and the absence of really bad neurological symptoms or maybe one level of stenosis, it's a degen spondy in the middle of a degen scoli. And the, the stenosis is really only symptomatic at four or five prior to your surgery. But I like to really blast out every level, take out those hypertrophic medial facets, because as you start moving the spine around and pushing things back to where they want to be and pushing vertebral bodies ventral, all of a sudden these lateral recess things that were asymptomatic pre-op or foraminal stenosis that was asymptomatic pre-op can become symptomatic and I just don't want to deal with it. So I, I will take out every little hypertrophic facet that I can find uh, in the most part. So what are, what are the indications? I, th I think that they're helpful for sagittal plane correction and adult degenerative scoliosis. Uh, I think in a large disc, Blenke looked at his experience through the thoracic spine and the lumbar spine. If they have a nice large disc or a desiccated disc that allows you to move it a lot, you can get pretty substantial sagittal angular, angular excursion at a single segment. Uh, if you do it with a T-lift, you can get quite a bit. I think that's what Dr. Chapman's gonna show us. I think in those, you either need to get the cage very up front so that you can lever around it. And in those, you wanna take out the joints bilaterally because if you don't, you can get iatrogenic foraminal stenosis from closing down too much in the back. Uh, or the extreme version uh, that Fred Sweet proposed that I have, uh, I, I like it in the right cases, is a trans foraminal anterior release. So it's like the X-lift that we just saw. You take the ALL out, ALL out through the trans foraminal approach now you have to park the cage in the back of the disc space uh, like this. So this was a 78-year-old woman. She's fused one to four and five to one with a pretty substantial 45-degree sagittal or mismatch of her, her parameters. We took out the ALL at four five, parked the T-lift cage in the back and gave her a 40-degree correction through a T-lift and something that took 20 minutes. PSOs, uh, these are for sagittal, essentially sagittal plane deformities that are fixed. You can use them for fixed coronal or um, biplanar deformities when you're just starting in your practice. I would just try to find some ankylosing spondylitis patients and things like that that, that are a bit more simple uh, rather than biplanar. And particularly, coronal plane can be very tricky because you don't, if their sagittal plane is appropriate, you don't want to pull them back as you pull them over because that'll lead to a PJK once their head's behind their pelvis. So they get a little bit more difficult. 
when they're, but they're for fixed deformities. So you, you need to get upright and supine film, see how much free correction you're going to get. Uh, because I, not everyone needs a PSO. When they have disk spaces, you can work through them. When they have non-union, sometimes the non-unions are mobile. They don't have like a rigid non-union. Uh, and the Lenke has shown in uh, the WashU series that if you get prone recumbents, can help you avoid uh, planning a PSO sometimes. Planning a PSO on a PIL mismatch on upright films, I would say, is inappropriate in this day and age. Most of you are going to get CT scans pre-op for those types of cases anyway. I love measuring the LL on the CT scan because I know that that's totally gravity free. And also you can get really nice views of the end plate. Sometimes the upright films, it's a little rotated and you're not exactly my really bisecting this ellipse that is now the, the T12 caudal end plate and you can underestimate or overestimate the, the lordosis that you have, which will lead to a bad surgical plan, which will potentially lead to bad execution and then a poor outcome. If you're gonna do them for combined biplanar deformities, so it's combined coronal and sagittal plane deformities, you need to think about where you're going to do it. If they are deformed or off coronally to the concavity of the curve, you perform the PSO at the apex of the curve, right? Because as you close that down and you shorten, so in the example here, it's gonna be shortening around L3, you're gonna bring their head back. But if they are deformed through the fractional curve, so suppose this was a bit straighter and this patient's over here, if you do an L3 PSO, you are gonna make their coronal malalignment even worse such as in this case. In these cases, you need to go to the end vertebra generally of the fractional curve. So that would be an L4 PSO to ensure that as you close that down, you're gonna bring the head back towards the midline. Uh, and this is what we were talking about with Dr. Lamartina's uh, sort of hinge osteotomy where you can park a cage here. Uh, I think like Dr. Hart said he likes to do. Uh, Lamartina will just resect this stuff hinge around it and then potentially fill this back in if he's got a big gap in the front. Uh, but I think that's a very nice way to get substantial correction still through just a PSO rather than going to anything more extreme. Types fives and sixes, uh, thoracic VCRs, uh, have become fairly limited in my practice in adult. You know, I saw a lot for PJK uh, in my training. Um, I am more sort of, I think, facile. I think it's faster, easier to take the ALL, ALL out at a PJK level and pop it. And the spine generally goes back to where it belongs in those cases. And it's a whole lot safer in my hands, I think, than a, than a VCR. VCRs, I think, are very good for these complex pediatric spinal deformities. Uh, this was a 12-year-old boy with a kyphosing scoliosis with coronal curve greater than 100, sagittal curve greater than 100. Uh, he was only walking with a front-wheeled walker when he came. Uh, and there's no way to treat these people otherwise than with a vertebral column resection. He got a two-level uh, VCR. So planning and, and evaluation, right? This is, you know the indications for the most part. This is really about how are you going to do this and how can you have complication avoidance? How can you maximize the results in your hand? You need to plan. You need to plan and you need to think about it. So have them stand up and have them lie down and clinic. This is the same patient, upright and supine. We see very little change in the, the sagittal plane alignment, correct? Her thoracic spine is fused in kyphosis. The lumbar spine is pseudoed flat with interbodies and all sorts of stuff everywhere. If you're gonna correct this and operate on this patient, you have to figure out how you're gonna correct it. It's gonna require a three column osteotomy in a case like this. Uh, in a case like this, you see this vacuum disc, right? It's flat from L4 to the sacrum, but this open disc at 3-4 gives you some chance at getting a 30 degree, 25 degree uh, single level interbody and perhaps making the patient happy. You got to get standard radiographs, right? And you need to understand them. You can't just go to the meetings and listen to people talk about PILL mismatch, T1 pelvic angle, this angle, that angle. You need to integrate which ones you want into your practice and understand how you're going to use them. I am, uh, I'm really fond of the T1 pelvic angle for looking at my prone shots after I've done my correction in the operating room to make sure that I'm in the right ballpark. I find the Rousselet classification, I don't know what, what you guys think of the Rousselet classification, but I am very fond of it, both for my pediatric and adult practices. Um, it allows you to, to think of what their spine looked like before 
uh, the misadventures with surgery or degeneration of aging. And it helps you dictate the UIV. So you know, Rousselli and some of the French guys will say that I've never had a PJK. That's not true. But they may minimize their PJK rates because they, have, they may tend to choose a more aggressive UIV based upon the fact that, that generally Rousselli type 3s and type 4s get an upper thoracic stop. And that will get rid of the T10 PJK that is a T10 to the sacrum with 65 degrees of lordosis with screws that point up like this. The screws that point up like that generally has not fared well in anything that I've ever seen. It's not, you know, the modulus mismatch of two screws going like that is not great for the 65-year-old bone. So 65 degrees of lordosis gets a T3 to the sacrum. As opposed to type 1s that are flat and they degenerate, so they get a flat back and they get some thoracic hyperkyphosis, but they already have some thoracic kyphosis. I have done those where you change them from 0 to 30 or 40 degrees of lordosis and stop at 10. The first handful of times I did it, I was very anxious that... I had swung them like this and stopped with, and they've actually fared pretty well. I think in part because their C7 plumb and gravity line is good with appropriate pelvic tilt correction. It also, that's the other thing, is I think it helps you understand where to do a PSO. I am a pretty big proponent of L4 PSOs in most cases. Perhaps the, the ones that are appropriate for L3 PSOs are the type 4s, and those are very high pelvic incidence patients. Uh, as the pelvic incidence climbs, the apex of the lumbar lordosis rises. And you start doing L3 PSOs for a, a Rousselli type 1 or a type 2, and you set the apex of the lordosis a bit too that high. Sometimes their pelvic tilt doesn't change, and then what they do for that is that they can rock forward, and that's the introverted type 3. So you've taken someone that doesn't need a lot of lordosis, given them a lot, and the way they compensate for it is to antivert, and the pelvis moves backwards. Uh, the ISSG, I think, is a very good resource uh, for if you want to know information about surgery, complications, and complication avoidance. I have found, like, participating in the group beyond, uh, like, the, the help is immeasurable in listening to people think, people talk about their experiences, and this is a very, very good surgical database uh, for this is what we did, this is what went right or went wrong. This is what we're doing now. This is what went right or what went wrong. And reading these, I think, is very worthwhile for how you're going to integrate uh, change from academics into a clinical setting. So they showed that if you start doing them higher, you don't get as much pelvic tilt change, uh, in part probably because of where the apex of the lordosis is. Surgical technique. You've got the patient in clinic. Uh, how many in the back, how many of you guys have ever seen an intraoperative wake-up test of Stagnara? Yeah, I had never, I trained at a big deformity center for my residency and had only read about it. And I think I saw five my fellowship year. Uh, and so you need to teach people that. You need, because the data monitoring is not going to be perfect. You need your patients to know what to do uh, if you're going to wake them up. You also need to warn them we might reverse your anesthesia and wake you up because uh, we've had a, a legal uh, complaint about someone that, that said they weren't aware that they were going to have a stagnara, possibly. Yeah, crazy. They, uh, but it, you got to do everything to relieve stress in your life, and you don't want that stress three test, months later test. either. I think using tranexamic acid at an appropriate dose, which we don't know quite yet, um, wash you trauma, not orthopedic trauma, general trauma, had a big DOD multicenter funded study uh, where they looked at high dose, low dose, and uh, placebo for polytrauma upon arrival to the hospital. Uh, it's not published yet, but the high-dose people actually had more VTE, which is not consistent really with what we have seen, what Larry has seen and presented. And in speaking to the, the, so the experts from this research project is that they say, one, we don't know how it works. We've got all these you know, anti-fibrinolytic hypotheses, but we don't truly know how it works. Because we don't know how it works, we don't know how to dose it. And they also thought that perhaps as we, they give four grams was their high dose. We give four grams a case almost every time. Uh, is that they thought maybe if you don't have all this endothelial damage and inflammation that happens at the time of a trauma, as opposed to it happens after uh, the dose has started, maybe that has an effect. But I don't think 10 and 1, 10 milligrams per kilogram bolus and 1 mg per kg, I don't think that's okay. We use 50 and 10 for our kids. Uh, have not had any problems with seizures or anything like that. 
Boston Children's is the one that did the study on 50 and 10. They actually did EEGs and they had no seizure activity. Use Gardner Wells tongs to position. These are long cases, prone positioning. I don't like the prone view. Their faces get swollen. This is the Gardner Wells tongs, much easier for anesthesia to see the eyeballs, make sure there's no pressure on your eyeballs. Uh, choice of beds, I, as I said in the lab, I like the articulated frames currently. Um, before that, I had already used, always used posted open frames with the uh, ASIS pads pretty low. You just need to be careful about how low you get all those things um, because if you get too low and you're kind of over the femoral nerve, you can get a femoral nerve neuropraxia. If they are a fixed kyphosis and you have the pads in wrong, uh, they can lie right on their quads and they can get a quad compartment syndrome. So that's in, in extreme cases of lumbar kyphosis. Oftentimes start with a sling so that they're draped over the pads. And then once you've done the osteotomy, you change the, the sling out to the flat board and then put in thigh pads if you need to. As they put in the, the flat boards, you even close your osteotomy. Uh, but don't, don't have too much pressure on the front of the thighs. Hypotensive, hypotensive anesthesia uh, during exposure, I think, is essential to minimizing blood loss because you're going to give the blood up later and you can't give it up early. You can't do exposures with six, seven, 100, 800,000 cc's of blood loss because you're going to lose it later. And that's how you change a case that could be 1,500 into a case that's 2,500 or 3,000 cc's, which is not great. Uh, we've kind of talked about this already. We can go through this quickly. One thing is that you know, the WashU teaching was if it's one o'clock and you haven't done your three column yet, then perhaps you know Chris uh, and Vidat have a really unique um, sort of team dynamic where they can get an osteotomy done in probably 20 or 30 minutes, which is not consistent with a lot of us, or especially for working with trainees. Uh, if it's one o'clock, think about stopping uh, because that case is then going to end at six or seven o'clock. You've been there for 10 hours, and I will guarantee you, I don't care what any of you guys say over there. You, the decision making at, at 10 hours in is not the decision making that's the same as five hours in. You're, things that, are, that were not going to be acceptable are now like, that's probably okay. Nothing is probably okay when you do this. If you start getting into probably okay, you're probably going to get complications and you need to minimize your complication rates. We talked about this. I don't really need to go over this for you. Closing the osteotomy. So uh, you can do this is a um, cerebral palsy patient, a 23-year-old CP that was fixed with 120 degrees of uh, lumbar scoliosis and came to me, he's nonverbal, um, had been to see three different gastroenterologists getting worked up. And when the resident showed me the picture, I said, oh man, that, that hurts. That is a rib on pelvis deformity. We know rib on pelvis deformities hurt from the 70-year-olds that come in. And you poke this poor kid right in his rib on pelvis and he groaned in pain. So we needed to get his rib off of his pelvis. Do a construct to construct closure, which is like I said in the, in the lab, you make a construct above and a construct below, and that is joined by a, a third rod through dominoes, and you can compress and distract and compress and distract. Uh, and this, this kid, the um, distraction of the concavity was actually limited by uh, his long-term contracted state and perhaps the CP. So once we got past a couple clicks of distraction, the EMG monitoring went completely bananas. And we take it off a little bit and it would go away. And I'd close and then say, okay, let's lengthen a little bit more. And the EMG would go crazy. Um, but it's a very nice way for doing a biplanar or a coronal only plane correction so that you can distract and compress through construct to construct. Uh, surgical technique, you have to monitor these cases. You should not do these without monitoring. In my experience and our experience at WashU, Neuromonitoring is not reliable for uh, root level deficits. I think that there's, there's a reasonable amount of debate with that now. Uh, Hanjo at HSS uh, remains pretty convinced that his group does uh, excellent transcranial monitoring for root level deficits. Uh, Chris, what is your last time we spoke about it that you were sort of not convinced with transcranial for root level? Or are you the same or different? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. So I, that's again why you should learn Stagnaris. It's also why, um, so we continue monitoring for one hour after closure. Um, we have had deficits come on after that. I have now had my first neurological deficit that evolved 12 hours after surgery. I did a um, CP, diplegic CP with a syrinx. Um, case went fine. I was kind of surprised at how much the spine gave us. Like I said, I don't do osteotomy. We're going to take what this gives us. I hate these syrinx cases. Um, transcranial motor data, fine. Wake up five out of five. I rounded at 7 a.m. on Saturday, fine. At 11 o'clock, starting journal club at my house, get a call from the floor that she's got a little bit of a foot drop. And I said, what the heck are they talking about? And then we call back and now she can't stand because her quad is a little weak. Um, and I told the fellow, go in and check, order the scan now, but I guarantee you when she gets out of the scanner, her left leg's gonna be completely out. So why don't you call the OR too? Out of the scanner, left leg's out, took her to the OR. Transcranial data is out on the left side uh, and took popped the rods and data came back and she recovered. But uh, so you can lose data post, post, post up too. Um, and then I always, regardless of your concern, especially for pedicle subtractions, because we just said that two of us think that you can't get good root level monitoring, always do an exam. Always do an exam. See if they have five out of five dorsiflexion and quadriceps. Uh, and then honestly, at that point, you need to think about whether if you find a deficit, this is again why to stop, right? If you find a deficit at seven o'clock, you're exhausted from just closing this thing. Are you gonna flip them over and open it up right then and there? Or are you gonna do it the next day? But you don't wanna find neurological deficits three days later, because the cat might be out of the bag by then. Post-op, mobilize them day one. Get them out of bed, make them sit in a chair. Uh, I start, my diet is I give them potato chips. I got this from the International Spinal Deformity Symposium a couple years ago, that you give them potato chips. It's almost impossible to eat too many potato chips. Uh, pulls some salt in, helps them get off some of the, the extra fluid. Seems to start their, um, their bowels working faster than what we had historically at Wash U. Uh, this year I'm presenting at SRS, we did a placebo uh, versus alvimapan randomized trial to see if trying to prevent the opioid effect of the uh, enteric system did anything. And the people that didn't get it, the people that got placebo actually had faster return to bowel function. So perhaps there's some role for alvimapan for the patient that's got established opioid induced ileus at some stage out, but it didn't seem to help for prophylaxis. And almost all of my patients leave at post-op day five after big surgeries like this. What are the complications? There's not enough time. Uh, and the most important, I think, is to remember that these are really complex cases. There's a lot of stuff that can go wrong. And what you need to do is what you guys are doing right now is watch, listen, and then take the time to ask Bob and, and Doug and Chris Ames and Justin Smith questions. Ask lots of questions. That's going to be far more informative than having us regurgitate papers for you that you can go read on your own. And then I unfortunately had to duck out when Dr. Ames was giving his talk, but the predictive analytics is really important for determining what that patient's risk is for that surgery. The problem with citing prevalence or incidence rates to patients is that it really doesn't apply to them, right? The prevalence or incidence of something, when you say we, we do these regression analyses and it's controlled over all these other things, that assumes that your patient falls into that mean for all of those other variables and it doesn't take those into account. What you really need to know is what is that patient's level of risk for any particular uh, complication after surgery, which is, I think, one of the, the real beauties of what, what Chris is doing. Pseudos are a frustrating complication, up to 20%. Um, I think that, so I, and I hate when people say multiple rod constructs because we all use multiple rods. Using three, four more rod constructs uh, seems to at least delay um, rod fracture. It may prevent rod fracture in the setting of pseudos in some cases, or it just may allow that, that big, long, sort of intramembranous ossification uh, that needs to happen that Bob and I were talking about early to, to happen prior to rod failure. Maybe with two rods, rods will fail before the intramembranous bone healing happens. But with more rods, perhaps it's stiff enough and lets it uh, have enough time before rods fail. And the other thing is that this is also where the predictive analytics are going to come in, is that we're really, in value-based healthcare, we're going to be judged on patient-reported outcomes to some extent. And we need to be able to use those to find, A, 
the people that are both likely to succeed and the people that are likely to fail. There's some, some of the writing in the predictive analytics world says that, that the real beauty is going to be able to find the people that are going to do well, not necessarily identifying the people that are going to do poorly. And then the other thing is that you'll see with some of the papers that are coming out is that we're also going to help set expectations. Uh, and as all the trainees will know, the rotation's miserable if you just show up and the attending expects you to do your thing, and then at the end he says you did a, you did a bad job because you didn't do this and you didn't do that, but he never told you that that's what you were expected. If you have these patients, you say, you know, I see that, that, that this is what your level of recreation is, and I understand that you want to go back. Now, who doesn't want to be 20 again? I want to be 20, but there are things that I'm never going to do again in my entire life. And if you can tell people you're not going to do that, the best we're going to do is take you from a one on this answer to a three, and a five is out of range of what is reasonable. They're going to have the expectation set, and their satisfaction with the surgery, and their perceived improvement is going to be better, rather than just doing it, not getting them where they thought they want to go, even though that was impossible, and they're disappointed, and they have some decision regret. Thanks.